But she said, the son of Sam, now this was months before the Netflix documentary came out. T.T. Jerry said, she's like, you know, the son of Sam, David, did not, did not kill all those people. He was involved in a cult. There were other murderers, but they, the, the city pinned it all on him. And then a few months later, this Netflix documentary comes out, came out a couple of years ago, basically saying that most likely son of Sam did not kill all those people. He killed maybe one or two, but there was other murderers that just got away with it. I'm afraid, I'm afraid to go out in the car, I'm afraid to do anything, never know where he's gonna be. Do you feel personally threatened by the 44 caliber killer because you have long dark hair? Yes, I do. Excuse me, I'm Jeff Kamen from Channel 11 News. Do you feel personally threatened by the 44 caliber killer because you have long brown hair? No, not at all. Did you ever think of cutting your hair because of him? Uh, no, I never thought of going to that extent. Of it. I want you to go out and kill. Kill! In 1976, on a dark night, two women were sitting in their cars, quietly sipping their sodas on the side of the road, when a strange man suddenly appeared, brandishing a gun. He opened fire on them. Shortly after, law enforcement received a message, a letter in which the murderer boasted about his crime. At that moment, authorities realized they were dealing with a serial killer, already responsible for six victims, better known by the sinister nickname Son of Sam. During that time, women made efforts to style their hair differently and change its color, hoping the killer wouldn't recognize them. One can't help but be captivated by the mystery surrounding his life, a series of chilling murders that shook New York, spreading terror through the streets of the city that never sleeps. But today, we will take you into the final chapter of this horrifying saga, where Berkowitz's dark journey finally reaches its conclusion. In your opinion, is the serial killer still at large today? Is there a risk that the serial killer might reappear at your doorstep? We'll find out right away. It's imperative to stay attentive until the end of this video to not miss any captivating events and discover fascinating information. I also encourage you to subscribe to our new channel and activate the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. David Berkowitz, nicknamed the Son of Sam, was born in the bustling streets of New York in 1953. He was adopted by a couple, his biological mother named Betty, and a businessman who was married to another woman named Joseph. David's biological mother, Betty, was in a financially dire situation and couldn't raise him, so she gave him up for adoption to a couple who couldn't have children. This decision would forever alter the course of his life. David was welcomed by this new couple, charitable souls eager to embrace him as their own flesh and blood. At first, everything seemed idyllic, but at the age of seven, an incident triggered a series of troubling revelations. David overheard the word adoption from his father, and he knew that these weren't his true parents. This realization led David to experience depression and even psychological issues, fundamentally altering the trajectory of his life. David's life took a drastic turn after a car accident left him with a head injury. This ordeal appeared to mark the beginning of a profound transformation in his personality. Gradually withdrawing, he distanced himself from his peers, leaving behind the friendships of his childhood. It seemed that David was destined for a dark fate, exacerbated by a tragic cancer diagnosis. While his adoptive mother loved him deeply, his father believed that adopting him was a mistake. David grappled with accumulating psychological problems until the age of 14. At this point, his mother was battling cancer, enduring suffering until her passing. Her death continued to impact the child's psyche repeatedly, as she was the only one who loved him like a true child. A few months later, his father remarried, intensifying David's anger towards him. He became increasingly aggressive, resorting to playing with fire to try to quell his anger and rage. He would take insects and ants and burn them alive, even setting fire to the houses of his neighbors. These were the initial signs indicating the personality of a killer. 
After joining the army at 18 to escape his home life, he acquired unexpected skills, learning how to use firearms. Three years later, at the age of 21, he decided to leave the military and return to civilian life in New York. He chose to go it alone, cutting ties with his father. Though he considered a career as a firefighter, fate had other plans. He became a security guard. David spent his nights in meditation, feeling increasingly disconnected from his environment. When he saw, for example, the happiness and joy on the faces of a couple or a family, resentment consumed him leading to dangerous and irrational thoughts. The years passed, the shadow of the past continuing to haunt him. One day, David tried to contact his biological mother, Betty, feeling like he was drowning in darkness and in need of help and love from someone, just like any normal person. The reunion with his mother was pleasant. She was happy to see her son whom she had abandoned long ago. They saw each other often and talked. David began to feel the love and tenderness of his mother, and he was overjoyed to see her smile again. However, this happiness soon turned to resentment as David discovered that his mother had another daughter, a stranger in his eyes. This shocking revelation further upheaved his tormented world, and he began to ponder why she had given him up for adoption while raising his half-sister in better conditions. It was at this point that feelings of hatred started to resurface and consume David, making him feel like the unwanted child his mother didn't want. Once again, he severed ties with his mother. The whirlwind of emotions overtook David, propelling this wounded heart towards peaks of hatred and anger. It seemed that every connection was irreparably breaking. David found himself isolated in the darkness of his own psyche, desperately seeking a glimmer of hope. The 70s are drawing to a close, and David, torn by his inner demons, immersed himself in increasingly alarming activities. After three years of this, David ignited over 1,500 mysterious fires that erupted in the streets of New York, all claimed in his sinister journals. David began to be drawn to satanic creatures and started reading their books in order to become the embodiment of darkness and a servant to forces beyond him. In November 1975, David completely isolated himself from the outside world, darkening all the windows of his apartment with blankets and sheets so that daylight couldn't penetrate for an entire month. He began to write and draw satanic images on the walls, as if he were possessed by something issuing him commands. On December 24, 1975, David decided to emerge from the shadows and commit his first murder. He concealed a large knife within his coat and walked the streets of New York in the very late hours. When he spotted his first victim, a young girl, he approached swiftly, drawing his weapon. Instinctively, he stabbed her multiple times. The girl attempted to escape and cried for help. She managed to break free from David's grip. Although severely injured, she succeeded in getting away. David fled and moved to a new street as his murderous appetite was not satiated. Shortly after, he attacked another young girl, this time only 15 years old. The modus operandi was the same. A sudden approach, an attempted murder, and a hasty escape. This time, the victim managed to evade a tragic fate, leaving the killer frustrated. Both girls were stabbed multiple times, but thankfully, they survived. In January 1976, David moved to a new place and a new apartment. In this location, he had a neighbor named Sam. Sam had a dog that wouldn't stop barking. David claimed that the dog was possessed by a demon and that its barks were telling him to kill. At that moment, David knew he had to continue killing. This time, David decided to use a 44 caliber, a firearm that would make him infamous. On July 29, 1976, he was driving in search of new victims. He spotted two young women, Donna and Judy, parked on the side of the road. He observed them closely, then approached them with his firearm. Without warning, he opened fire five times, killing Judy instantly with a shot to the neck and seriously injuring Donna in the thigh. The police and investigators were faced with a violent crime. 
they found that the bullet used by the killer was of .44 caliber, a rare weapon at the time. The wave of crime in New York in the 1970s was so extensive that this brutal murder didn't receive much media attention. David failed to attract the attention he so desired. In David's confessions, he mentioned that he went to a large shopping mall in western New York and was desperate to become known to the public. He wanted his crimes to make headlines and his name to be known to all. He stated that if he had the opportunity to have a machine gun, he could kill everyone in the mall so that the world would know who he is. David didn't stop there. His murderous obsession resurfaced. On October 29, 1976, he committed another murder. This time, he got into his car and cruised the streets of New York in search of new victims. He headed to a well-known street called Love Street, believing that lovers are the happiest people, hoping to disturb the tranquility of the couple strolling there. His new target was a young couple, Carl DeNaro and his girlfriend, who were in a parked car on the side of the road. David followed the same routine. He approached their vehicle, pulled out his firearm, and opened fire without warning. In this bloody attack, Carl was hit in the head, and his girlfriend managed to get out of the car and flee. After David left, his girlfriend returned to the car and drove Carl, who was losing a lot of blood, to the nearest hospital. If you look closely at Carl's photo, he has long hair. According to the investigators, David believed Carl was a woman. As you know, David harbored resentment towards women because of his mother. Carl was able to survive thanks to his girlfriend. On November 27, 1976, two young women, Donna, 15, and Joan, 18, miraculously escaped death when the .44 caliber shooter opened fire. Incredibly, they both survived, but Joan was hit and remains paralyzed. On January 30, 1977, 26-year-old Christine met a tragic end during a movie date with her fiancé. As they left the cinema and got into their car, David began tailing them. He eventually intercepted them on the roadside, armed, and proceeded to open fire. Christine lost her life instantly, struck by a bullet to the head and another to the neck. Her fiancé managed to escape, providing further evidence of David's pronounced targeting of women. This was the second victim that David was able to truly kill. Since this crime, the police began to see a resemblance to the previous crimes, mainly because of the firearm, the 44 caliber. At that moment, the New York police gave the name the 44 caliber killer. If you've noticed, the killer targets his victims, primarily women with long, dark, or brownish hair, and this will be confirmed in the next victim. On March 8, 1977, a student named Virginia left the university to go home. David saw her walking alone on the street, and when he was sure there was no one around, he seized the opportunity. He walked towards her and positioned himself in front of her, raising his weapon. Virginia held up her book to protect herself. David fired through the book, hitting her in the face and killing her with a single shot to the head. What's strange about this story is the time of the murder. It was around 7.30 in the evening, right at the beginning of the night, whereas the other crimes were committed in the middle of the night or at dawn. His confidence in himself began to grow gradually. It was the first time he committed a murder at this hour. When the police examined the bullet from the crime, they confirmed that it was indeed a 44 caliber, just like the previous crimes. At that moment, the police officially declared that they were dealing with a very dangerous serial killer. David got the attention he wanted. Everyone was talking about him, even in the newspapers and headlines. They called him the, the 44 caliber killer. The .44 caliber killer is terrorizing New York with random murders, spreading fear among the residents. David, the perpetrator of all these crimes, derives a kind of morbid satisfaction from it, displaying articles about them on his wall. People notice that there's a certain pattern among the victims that David has killed. In order to avoid being recognized, the women either cut their hair or change its color. Everyone was afraid of being the next victim. The New York police, 
determined to stop this serial killer, formed the Omega Team, consisting of 30 officers and investigators. Their mission, track down the mysterious 44 caliber killer. On April 17, 1977, David, now known as the Son of Sam, attacked a couple, Valentina and Alexander, at 3 a.m. He followed them in his car and then shot them at close range through the windshield. Both victims died instantly, indicating a surge in the killer's confidence. He left a message for the police describing himself as a predator hunting the women of New York. In the letter, he stated, I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I am hidden from you. I am tuned to a different wavelength than everyone else. I am a predator. I enjoy hunting. I roam the streets and seek my victims. I love delicious meat. The women of New York, they are the most beautiful. This message was signed in the name of Son of Sam. Since that day, his nickname changed from the 44 caliber killer to the Son of Sam. This name is linked to a neighbor, Sam, who believed David was possessed by the devil due to his dog's constant barking. The killer attempted to shoot the dog with a rifle from his window. Surprisingly, the dog survived with only a minor injury. David decided to write a new letter to journalist Jimmy Breslin, who was one of the best journalists in New York. According to David, if he wanted his story to be written and become famous, Jimmy was the most suitable journalist for the task. In this letter, he mentioned his previous crime and the victim, Donna. He said in the letter that it had been a year since Donna was killed, and he also wrote that she was a kind woman who deserved to be honored. This letter shocked Donna's family and all of New York. How could he be sympathetic? He encouraged the police to capture him, stating in the letter, Upon my capture, I promise to buy all the guys working on the case a new pair of shoes if I can stand up. His words had an explosive effect on public opinion, further amplifying the already palpable panic. The New York police were inundated with over 250 calls a day from citizens reporting individuals they suspected, even among their own acquaintances, of being Son of Sam. This wave of terror fueled the mystery surrounding the killer. The investigators of the New York police were engaged in the largest manhunt in the city's history to apprehend Son of Sam, an elusive serial killer. Despite attempts to sketch his portrait, the criminal remained enigmatic. The pressure on law enforcement escalated with each passing day. On June 26, 1977, two victims were attacked, a young couple named Judy and Salvatore. As usual, the killer followed them in a car before striking suddenly. Fortunately, both survived. Then, on July 31, 1977, Son of Sam struck again, this time targeting a young couple, Stacy and Robert, both 20 years old. This attack instilled terror in New York, as Stacy had blonde hair, a first for the killer. Unfortunately, Stacy passed away while Robert lost his sight due to the attack. In the New York Journal, in bold on the front page, it read, No one is safe from Son of Sam. This serial killer had raised the level of horror in New York, seemingly deriving pleasure from his notoriety and daring the police with each new crime. The pressure on law enforcement was at its peak, mobilizing dozens of investigators and officers. No fewer than 75 investigators were deployed, supported by 225 police officers, all dedicated to this relentless pursuit. After days of fruitful investigations and searches, the investigators got hold of a key witness, Cecilia, a 49-year-old woman. She was near the scene of a crime just before it occurred. At that moment, she encountered a strange individual carrying something suspicious under his clothing. Her reaction was instantaneous. She made the decision to turn around, distancing herself from the man before returning home. A few minutes later, the sound of a gunshot echoed. According to Cecilia, if she hadn't reacted so quickly, she could have been the victim of this elusive killer. Cecilia, brave and perceptive, immediately went to the police station to report this crucial encounter. 
She told the police that she saw an officer ticketing a car parked in front of a fire hydrant. Cecilia believed that this car belonged to the strange individual because he was walking in the same direction as his car. The police checked the issued tickets for that day and found that a patrol officer had indeed issued four tickets that night, one of which was against David Berkowitz, the mysterious Son of Sam. A detail that might have gone unnoticed if Cecilia hadn't had the foresight to persist in her statements. The investigators followed a simple parking ticket to locate David. They immediately sprung into action, surrounding David's apartment and finding his car parked just across the street. They discovered a threatening message from the killer in his car, summarizing what he had written. You couldn't kill me. I'd drive you crazy. A threat even before he could relay it to the police. It was a moment of triumph. The police then closed the car door and stood around the perimeter in hiding. After a long wait, David appeared and was apprehended by the shouting police. Police! Police! Do not reach for your weapon! The chief said that Davis slowly turned his head with a mad smile and said, You finally caught me. What took you so long? As if he knew he would be arrested from one day to the next. Once apprehended, he was taken to the main police station in New York under heavy police escort. On the way, David smiled and told the officer to comb his hair before meeting the public and the journalists. Everyone wanted a glimpse of the man who had terrorized the city for months, gathering in masses. They wanted to see the one who had instilled fear in the streets of New York. During the subsequent press conference, damning evidence was presented, newspaper clippings, photographs of the victims, the weapon used to kill them. Everything was there. David had a disturbing habit. He collected images of his victims and displayed them in his home, sometimes even adding satanic drawings on the walls. He claimed to hear voices of demons, insisting that these voices never ceased. He said he punched holes in the wall to release the demons. When the police examined the apartment more closely, they discovered strange notes. One of them was labeled Mr. William, claiming he was raising children to sacrifice them when they grew up. This note, placed next to a hole, was signed by the killer. Here's what he had written. Hi, my name is Mr. Williams, and I live in this hole. I have several children, and I am raising them to become killers. The lead investigator was troubled. He knew David was much more than just a common criminal. According to journalists, he was a part of a much larger satanic cult. Maury Terry, a journalist, had dedicated his life to investigating these theories until his death. He believed in satanic cults and that David didn't act alone. However, it was challenging to distinguish fact from fiction in these bewildering accounts. This journalist had written a book titled The Ultimate Evil, The Search for the Sons of Sam. Even Netflix had created a documentary series about this intriguing investigation, titled The Sons of Sam. After an intense manhunt, he was finally apprehended and sentenced to life in prison for the six victims. His time behind bars was far from peaceful, marked by violent confrontations. A decade later, Berkowitz surprised everyone by converting to Christianity, becoming an unexpected spiritual advisor to his fellow inmates. Today, he still resides in prison. When the day of his parole hearing arrived, David himself requested to cancel the session, candidly explaining that he believed he deserved to be behind bars for the rest of his life. He claimed to be an instrument of God, having found peace in accepting his punishment. Every two years, the possibility of a parole hearing arose, but he never attended. He had chosen to remain in prison. Even today, the son of Sam remains behind bars, seemingly unfazed by it. In your opinion, if David has chosen to convert to Christianity, could this represent a glimmer of hope for him to escape the grip of prison, even though the possibility of parole remains uncertain? Will he reconsider his crimes? Will he change cities or countries to sow panic and kill innocent women as he did before? Let us know in the comments. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and activate the notification bell so you won't miss any of our future videos.